in motion is Sewell. Goff to throw. Wants to throw it to Sewell. Oh, he oh, caught it. Boy, yes. Sewell on a first down. Oh, yes. the big man dives down to the 31 yard line. Oh, that is beautiful. Welcome to the 20 in the Huddle podcast presented by Microsoft and I have taken the show on the road to the owners meetings in Phoenix. I'm really happy to welcome in Dan Campbell, head coach of the Detroit Lions. And Dan, let's start with this. How fun is this time of year? I mean, last year or last week, excuse me, you had the first wave of free agency, right? You, you, you get a chance to make your football team better. You're in draft mode. Um, you, you guys have prospects come into the building that the guys are going to be back April 17. That's only a couple of weeks away. Just how fun is this, this time frame on the NFL calendar? Yeah, look, it is. It's uh, it, it, it's a lot of fun. And to your point, to be able to, uh, and upgrade your roster and continue to build uh, on top of your team, you know, to build on top of the foundation that has already been built. And I do feel that that way after two years, man, our, our, the concrete is it, concrete has been poured. So, um, that, that, that's a good feeling. And anytime you can revamp and reload on your team with the right guys, uh, that's exciting. The right guys, that's a key point. I know you talked about that this morning, but let's start with some of the guys that you re-signed. You know, guys like Alex Anzalone, um, Kamish, um, Isaiah Bugs. I mean, guys that are really key guys to the roster. Why was it so important for you guys to get those guys signed back first and foremost? Yeah, I'd give you two more. I'd give C.J. Moore and, and Germ back. Yeah. Although you could say he was really a free agent, but but yet he's he was here, you know, in 21. It, it's important because, first of all, uh, those guys serve a role for us that we can use on Sunday. They bring something to the table. They, they are productive players and in a certain role for us. And so that's number one. Number two is, man, they're all about what we're about, man. They love ball. They they uh, they love it, man. And they endear themselves to their teammates. You know, they they have all the intangible qualities, and uh, and they're willing to put in the work. So to have these guys back, I just think is big on multiple levels, man. They're glue guys, right, Dan? I mean, yeah. they make guys around them better. You look at some of the dirty work that that Kamish does, and some of the games yeah. and stunts, and allows. Um, Hutch to 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 get the flash play like you need guys on the roster like that that's don't right. you I mean that's what makes it go it, I think I, yes absolutely and I think of it like this man we you, those are guys that man everybody to a man on the team roots for those guys yeah they want them to have personal success of course we all want the team success but they like they they will do anything for those guys because they know those guys will lay it all on the line for them. What about some of the new guys? Let's start with C.J. Gardner-Johnson, a guy that you and Aaron Glenn obviously have history with. Kind of a late development. You guys didn't think you'd maybe be in the mix for him, but it, but it worked out. What are you guys getting in, in him? And then we can touch on uh, Cam Sutton and, and Emmanuel Mosley as well. Yeah, look, I'd say this about C.J. Yes, we, we got history with C.J. And, uh, you know, C.J. brings uh, a level of competitiveness that, that will serve us well on the back end. Or two, he's got versatility. He can play nickel. He can play safety. If you had to th put him in a pinch and you needed him outside, he could go out there and function. But So he's got this versatility. He can pressure. He's a blitz player, all right? Uh, he can cover. Uh, he can play the run. Uh, and so he, he just, man, he, when we talk about, you know, everybody gets, they hear me say it, football player. He is a football player, yeah. dude, man. And, uh and there again, man, just his level of, of uh, intensity, I think, will raise the level of that room. What about Cam and, and Emmanuel, too? Kind of the yep. same kind of players, guys that have shown some versatility, tough, yep. gritty, right? Love to tackle, which I know yep. is a prerequisite to even play There's defensive no doubt. football for you. There's no doubt. And, uh, look, I would say we identified both of those guys early in the process. You know, you start going, you're, you're looking at them, and you rate all these guys and personnel department, the coaches, we rate them A1 hey, to – you know, go down the list, man. Here you go, one all the way to, to what's left down there. And I would say this, there was, man, you know, there'd be a, maybe some teams that would have rated, uh, maybe some corners higher or this or that. Man, I tell you what, when I went through, I could not get my eyes off of Sutton. I could not. I could not. I love the way he played, and you could just tell it was a fit. He is a nasty, tenacious, smart football player with versatility. And I'm like, how, how do we, how, do, how can we not sign this guy? Right. So. And Mosley is very much the same. He just, he had the injury. Right. 
you talked about a little bit at breakfast um, on on Tuesday morning, but the expectations obviously are ramped up. I, in the 15 years covering this team, I can't remember the expectations being as high as they are right now. But you guys are embracing it, and how much have you seen that kind of spread throughout Allen Park and that building as well? Yeah, I, I think you can you can feel that. And uh, look, I and there's nothing wrong with that. We should, you know, those expectations should go up and we should put more pressure on ourselves to get it done because that's that's the name of the game. Standards will always stay the same, but the expectations should go up. And with that, though, with that means this. We have to go back and do everything that we did last year to get ourselves in the position we did to end the season. As far as the where we ended playing that type of football, we're playing pretty good football because of the, the amount of work we put in, man, all the detail that went into it, the the groove, the rhythm that we found, and then we got to surpass it. So at a at a minimum, we have to get back to what that was, and then we got to surpass That's the it. starting so, point. So and yeah, then, and, yeah. And so you got to put all the work in. Now we we can't just acquire C.J. Sutton. Here's Montgomery, man. Here's Mosley. Here we resign these guys, and then walk out there and say we're just going to win. Doesn't work that way. So, but it's also why we brought the guys that we did back and acquired the guys that we did because these these dudes will get after it, man. They're not going to be complacent. They're hungry for more. I want to take you back to your your playing days in year one to year two. We we hear that all the time about that's the biggest leap in in production and in comfortability for players. A is that a real thing? And how excited are you that you had so many young guys play key roles, especially on defense? And if they take those kind of leaps, Dan, with the guys that you've added, just how excited are you about what that could mean for your football team? I'm I'm very excited about it, and it, and that that year one to year two is a real thing. I do believe it's a real thing. I lived it. Now, let me say this. Back then, though, you still had uh, you had a full off season. You had two days, full <laughs> pads for, you know, and so there was a lot more. You you had more time to develop. Yeah. You had a lot more. But but I do know this because you're in a rhythm, man. You know the schedule. You know what you're getting ready to, to do. You, you've gone through those drills before, man. You understand what the coach wants out of it. I do believe there's a huge jump from year one to year two. So. Um, and it is exciting because we are so young. And that's what I said. At, at a minimum, you just – we re everybody back we had on this defense. And now all those young guys get better. Hutch gets a little better. Matt gets a little bit better. Even though he's going into year three, he's going to continue to improve, you know. And uh, and you just go down the line with Barnes and Rodriguez and Kirby. And uh, and then you get some guys back from injury. And we're not even talking about the draft yet. We yeah. haven't even drafted. We're going to be better. <laughs> Five picks in the top 81 there, too. That's right. So what you guys can improve – on that sense, I want your relationship with with Brad because we talked to you and we talked to um, Brad here, and, and really a lot of the same things in, in terms of character, what you're looking for, how you want to build this. Is that that seems to be a very close relationship between you and Brad? And how important is that when you're trying to build this thing the way that that you guys want to build yeah, it? Listen, it's uh, it, it's everything. It's everything, man. If the, the GM and head coach don't see eye to eye or aren't willing to work through things or have a true vision together you're you're gonna you'll never succeed and if you do it won't last so um brad and i have got uh i think a great great relationship and and to this day i i would tell you this it's eerie just how similar we think and and when one of us is thinking one thing and the other one mentions is like man i was just thinking and it, and really i mean we I think we see the game very much the same way we see players very much the same way we value the same things in players um and um, and then when we do, man, if we don't feel the same way about something, we there's there's a discrepancy. Man, we're man enough to talk it out. Here's how I see it. Here's how you see it. And then, man, we may just sleep. You know, the next day you sleep, and you come back in, you talk about it again, and all of a sudden, I just went to his viewpoint. He came to mine. You know, and so it, it's great, man. A uh, little bit of news, doing the joint practices. Um, you got the Giants. Um, you guys are going to do that week one. Now, I know you and Dable are, are, are pretty close there. There was a little back and forth there. He he had the interview. You had the yeah. Hobbit feed. You, you want to keep that thing going? You got any stories on, on, no, on Dable well, before we start? Are you just going to cut that off? No, here's what's funny. So <laughs> we're, we're sitting in one of these meetings, right? And uh, it was day one of the meetings, and we're in there, and I'm looking across at him, and, and – uh, and then I look, my phone blows up. So he sends me a text. He's like, hey, man, how many days are we practicing? And so I sent him back. I said, seven days. And I said, and it'll be sun up to sundown, so get your ass ready. <laughs> and, and so he just sends back, ha-ha. But um, 
Now, listen, Dave's is he's a good guy, and one of the reasons we're partnering with he and Joe Shane, who's a GM, and then I, you know I know Mr. Mayor, hell, I played for the Giants, is that it's an organization that I think's uh, top notch. It's a class act, and and they're going to have a good handle of their players like we will ours, and we'll get good work without all the BS that goes with it. Well, Dan, I know uh, everybody's excited for, for what you guys have done in free agency, and that's not done yet. There's still some more to be done there. The draft is fast, fast approaching, and then the guys will be back. There's a lot of excitement around this team. It's a fun time to be a Detroit Lions uh, a fan. Thanks for joining me. We appreciate yeah, it. No, and let me finish with this. Just the last thing on this is no matter what happens, man, I think, I think one of the best things about what we're doing and what we're building is we can handle adversity no matter what comes our way. No you matter what that year. is, we can handle it, and uh, we'll overcome it, and we'll be better for it. That's awesome. Okay. Dan Campbell. Welcome back to the 20 in the Huddle podcast presented by Microsoft. We've already heard from Dan Campbell, and I welcome in P.J. Clark. It's a downgrade. <laughs> well, PJ, we also got a chance to talk to Brad Holmes um, down here at the owners' meetings, and he went through a number of things that I think we need to touch on. We'll have some video of Brad kind of, you know, talking about some of the things that we covered. I think me and you will just kind of do an overview on some stuff. So let's start with this, um, the free agency additions. And a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. And look, let's start with the guys that they re-signed, Kamish, um, Alex Anzalone, uh, Isaiah Bugs, to me, really glue pieces, right? Dan Campbell talked about that a little bit too. And, you know, guys that do all the dirty stuff that that you just need on your roster, and and they're guys that I, I Brad mentioned it. Bugs played a lot of snaps. Kaminsky was a little banged up. Too played many a lot snaps, of snaps. Bugs said. And, and there, Alex is the the quarterback of the defense. Green dot man in the middle. C.J. Moore is a, a core special teams guy. Will Harris played a lot of snaps. Yeah, all of the guys that that were brought back were contributors and I think that's why you saw the number that got brought back and and all of them played an important role last year and I would assume that's going to continue moving forward and then they add new pieces um you know CJ Gardner Johnson obviously a big one yep. and, and, and I love the story that Brad told about you know not really thinking they had a chance for him that that went to midweek and Brad talked about it being his kind of time of solace that that drive home from Allen Park that drive home from the office right but every day, starting midweek, that first week of free agency, he called Gardner Johnson's agent. Just checking in. Got, called him on on Thursday. Called him on Friday. And on Friday, he maybe started to get a little sense that that maybe some some wheels were turning a little bit. And then Sunday, that came together, and he told the story about waking up his family. It was like 10, 10.30 at night. And it's worth waking worth everybody up for. Everybody, it. yeah, his wife, kids, and we're in bed. And, I, you know, like he's getting texts from um, Aaron Glenn, who obviously has a history with Gardner Johnson from their time in New Orleans. So that one, that was a great story of kind of how, uh, inside look of kind of how that developed. But, look, Cam Sutton said that um, – Brad was the first person that called him on free agency, and and Emmanuel Mosley, they targeted him too, and I just get the sense they were perfect fits, um, not not only football wise but character, everything. Well, they want this this franchise to be. They just they they fit everything. I think when you sign two guys, especially Cam Sutton, with the money, and as quickly as it ended up happening, then that's your guy. You are IDing that from the yeah. jump, and that is who you were dead set on this entire time and then to acquire a a game breaker like Chauncey Gardner Johnson in at the end of the first wave is just you know the very important cherry on top to this all and then the other side of of, of the ball too they talked about Jamal Williams and, and and both Dan and Brad said look Jamal was our target to begin with that was who we wanted to sign we had allocated money to do that um and it just didn't work out um, so when they kind of got that sense that it wasn't going to work out, they pivoted to David Montgomery. And, you know, Dan talked about it, too. That, that was a guy that when you prepared for Chicago, you obviously had to prepare for Justin Fields. But Dan was very adamant that David Montgomery jumped off the tape, too. And he was a guy that we always had to focus on the last couple of years. And so now you bring a guy in probably a little bit better uh, in pass pro, certainly a better um, you know, receiver out of the backfield. And then Graham Glasgow, um, a guy obviously Lions fans know very well, um, drafted in 2016 in the third round, spent the last three years in Denver, but a guy that 
can play right guard. He can play left guard. He can play center. Um, it sounds like um, Big V is, is trending in the right direction. So now you've created some competition at right guard, which is a good thing as well. And so I think the totality of free agency, and look, it's not done yet. Uh, that was just the first wave, and I think there will be some some more signings. But I got the sense from Brad and, and Dan that they're really excited about what they brought in. Yeah, Montgomery to, to me is... Ben mentioned it on the podcast with you. It's like when you're you're doing your self scout and you go, okay, we had a lot of four and five yard runs that we make a guy miss in the second level go for ten and fifteen. David Montgomery is an elite tackle breaker, yeah, and that's where I think obviously you have an elite offensive line, but if you can get a guy like that into the second level and he's got a one on one with a safety or a linebacker could see a lot more explosive plays in the run game. This and you're year. already going to see him with, with Swift. Uh, obviously, the issue with Swift has just been availability. But, you know, if, if they, he can get back, he can get over that, and you've got him and Montgomery and their elusiveness, ability to break tackles like you talked about, ability to, 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 to make plays in the passing game. I think that's a terrific one-two duel behind that offensive line especially. And Graham, just it's another, it's another piece. It's another... If you need a, a backup center, God forbid, he's there. If you need him to play either guard spot, he's there. And and to get familiarity with Hank Fraley and Frank Ragnow and Taylor Decker, somebody that's been in the organization before, I, I don't think that can be discredited either. But just on the basis of, of the player, I mean, the starter experience at, at three positions like that, can't beat it. Speaking of backups, the backup quarterback job, and we talked to Brad about Jared Goff and and the quarterback position and you know maybe any drafting of a quarterback high or having some competition there and it's Jared Goff's job let's be very clear about that both Brad and Dan were very clear about that but this is what Brad had to say about potentially continuing to look for a backup quarterback um, you know I, I think the the whole thing about that is is transparency and and, and communication and um, you know um, you know, I had I had I communicated with Jared at the end of the season about, you know, just like I told you guys at the combine about just, yeah, we got Jared, but we didn't have anything else behind him. So um just letting him know that, you know, look, man, we gotta get some more behind you. You know, um I think yeah, we are in a unique position, um, you know, with, with all the picks that we have to, you know, add add, you know, maybe a pretty talented guy if we go that direction. Um, but you know, again, it's, it, it doesn't have to be the first round and have to be the second round. It can be at, be at, at any point. Um, but I just feel like we're in a good place right right now, but we just kind of keep the communication open. And um, just so, you know, as you're saying, if Jared, you know, if we were to go that direction and add one, um, they, they, he, he's aware exactly what we're doing. You did say backup quarterback was a priority. I mean, are you, how do you feel about essentially rocking with the same? quarterbacks yeah well you know we, we really like Nate like we, we really did and well, I'm all aware of the the mystery behind Nate about the lack of game experience and um, you know um, but we did like Nate you know we were looking at some other quarterbacks that had a little bit more game experience uh, but obviously it just it just didn't uh, work out but it's not like we had a pool of experienced quarterbacks that we were just looking through and then this do not work I mean really it was really down to three guys really including Nate so it was just only looking at like really two guys that we were kind of just looking at it didn't work out and so and um and we, we let Nate know that as well and his agent you know about you know what our process was and I just think that when when, when you're honest with the players you know you just you know it's just it's it's better um it's a better approach and that's the best approach that's the only approach that we use um but yeah I mean we, we still like Nate you know um if, if, if we do add another one then Obviously, you know, Nate would, would, would be competing. And, Peach, I think that's where it's at, right? I mean, they obviously re-signed Nate Sudfeld, um, a guy who they're very familiar with, who did a nice job last year as the backup, but doesn't have a lot of game experience. I think he's played in six games. I think he's had 37 passes in his career. And so, you know, they were looking for, you know, they, they had that group of three, like like Brad said, of quarterbacks that they were kind of, you know, wanting to sign couple of them had more experience than Nate. Didn't work out. Nate's back. But I wouldn't be surprised if, if they add another one to that room based off Brad's comments. I think they want competition there. But it's going to be competition for the backup quarterback job, not the starter job. Yeah, and I, I think obviously Nate did 
everything he needed to do because if he didn't then he wouldn't have been brought back but when you look at the market this year there were a lot of names when we did the free agency preview there were a lot of names Minshew and you know Teddy Bridgewater there were a lot Jacoby Brissett a lot of those guys had starting experience were starting quarterbacks for teams before they shifted into backup roles and okay you can't you know if you wanted somebody with more starting experience, you can't force people to sign with you. You make your best offer and they take it or they right. don't. And and Nate Sudfeld has has been in the system, knows the offense, knows Jared, knows the room. I think that's all really important. But just even having Nate Sudfeld, I think that does make it easier for a potential rookie to come in having two guys that are not new and know the room and know Mark Brunel and know Ben Johnson and know the offense. It's just another person that a, a, a rookie could potentially learn from. I got a sense for Brad that that'll be something that they look to do, that they want to build some competition and some depth behind Jared, make sure they have a good, solid plan if something does happen um, to Jared and, and one of these guys has it, to play. It's never a bad thing to be prepared, especially when you have playoff expectations and you want to win a lot of games that, you know, Jared goes down, the season can't, can't be, be over. over. Right. Well, let's talk about the reason why all the NFL people are down here. It, it's some of the proposals and bylaws and, and some of the league business. Um, the Lions had a couple proposals. Uh, they had four originally, um, took two off the table, uh, left two. They were the having uh, the availability of a third quarterback to come in in an emergency and then having an extra um, challenge, challenge. Because yep. how Dan used the example talking to us in the breakfast in the morning was the catch, no catch, and how that's usually that's decided whatever the ruling on the field is right or wrong if it's close and it can't be decided that's usually where they go and he said teams usually waste a lot of the challenges on um that part or and that, that part of the, the game. game and then you're done for the game and so giving um teams an opportunity to have a third challenge uh, unfortunately that proposal did not pass um the proposal for the third quarterback was tabled and i think the reason for that is determining the language between is that quarterback on the 53-man roster is that quarterback on the practice squad how does that work so I think that's one that we could still see come to fruition but I think some of the finer details of how that'll work roster wise will have to be figured out and I think that the third quarterback specifically coming from the Lions when we just talked about the backup quarterback and how they're going to have to bring in potentially a third guy is just an interesting layer so if you're if you are advocating for that rule, you got to have three guys that are able to go out there and play. Our point exactly why we talked about. See how all these kind of stack it's up all together? It's stacking together. Yeah, it's just like a puzzle. You just have to put it all together and figure it out. You know, another thing uh, Brad talked about was the, the character issues and, and how you weigh that in evaluating um, draft talent. Obviously, Jalen Carter and, and the news um, with him, and we both have watched the tape. We, we saw him at Georgia last year. He's good player an extreme talent in the middle at a position of need for the Detroit Lions. Um, but obviously there's some character stuff that that's come about. And, um, you know, here's what Brad had to say about just the difference between an extreme talent and, and character issues and, and how you evaluate and weigh those when you're talking about taking a guy, you know, that high in the draft. Somebody. Yeah, again, it's always case by case. You know, these kids are young college kids and, um, you know, I've, I've, I've read a lot of things about just kind of, you know, from a brain standpoint, you know, where your frontal lobes are developed at that point. And, you know, some of the things that I did in college, I probably wouldn't want anybody to know about. Um, but, you know, so again, you got to just take it case by case. But, you know, um, you kind of ask about what is the one thing. And I, I'd say football character um, is probably the biggest thing uh, is in terms of just, you know, your passion for the game, you know, um, your, you know, your mental toughness, leadership, work ethic, accountability, all that stuff. You know, that, that always reigns, reigns number one. Well, and I, what he said about football character, I thought was important too, because I think there is a difference. It, it, is he on time to meetings? Is he all about ball? Does he value his teammates? Is he good in the locker room? Um, you know, obviously you don't want to be in a situation where you draft a guy and you're regretful for it, for something he does away from the football field. But I think to make that decision at six, you've got to have a really good feel about his football character. And I think that's what they'll have leading up to April 27th. And I think there's, you know, a month left to figure that out on all of these guys, not just Jalen Carter. I mean, yeah. you do you do background into to everybody. And when you're picking at 6 and 18, there's a, a big crop of 
blue chip guys that you have to be familiar with and be ready to draft if one of them is on the board at either of those spots in in the first round you know just because you don't want to miss on a first round pick like that and it gets you know less the stakes go down as yeah. the draft board goes down but there's still we talked about it off the top when you're bringing in a cam sutton from pittsburgh a mosley from san francisco a cj gardner johnson who you have had before in dan campbell and aaron glenn and you know what he's like in the room and that's a that's a big person you've already got isaiah bugs you've already got anzalone you guys because i know where you're going with this guys that have been in the league character guys good locker room guys you think you have the veteran leadership in that room now does that afford you the opportunity to take a swing what did dan say at breakfast on tuesday morning can have one of those guys, maybe two. Maybe two. Can have one of those guys if you feel like your locker room is strong enough. And Which, you've got enough of those guys that in, you talk about. In year three and you're bringing in your own guys now? Could I be at so. that point. I think you're at that point. Could be at that point. Now the now the, the, the job is the division. Now it's to play with the big boys, as, as Dan said. And so, um, you know, sometimes you need, you know, a guy like that that can put you over the edge and and feel you feel confident enough that you've got a locker room that can handle maybe some of those if you decide there are a few yeah, of if, those just and if and, and if that's the player i think you have to just decide first and foremost if that is your just on on talent alone yeah if that is the guy you want to go with then you go to the next to, step you have to shift into okay, how does he fit in the position room how does he fit in the locker room but to to the first point is you got to decide if that is the, the guy. player. Yeah, and that'll be first and foremost. All right, Pete, let's finish with this. Um, we talked about all the free agency additions and, and and the guys and just how that might affect the draft. And look, when you were seeing the mock drafts before free agency, the Lions corner, were taking a corner at 6, a corner at 18. Corner, safety at 18, safety at 48, corner in the corner third at round. 55. <laughs> and obviously with the additions of some of the, the veteran guys in free agency, um, you know, that's not so much a need, but but Brad talked about, um, you know, it's always for him about talent over need. That he has no um, depth chart in the in the locker room. That's just like it. That's always been the way that he drafts it. it it's best player, and I think free agency does allow them some freedom. There's obviously some positions of need, and you can't exclude cornerback because C.J. Gardner Johnson and um, Emmanuel Mosley are on one year deals. Um, de- depending on the the fifth year option with Jeff, which they have to decide by May, he could be on his two cornerbacks last year. currently under contract. For yeah, so you know it, it may not be a a, a need for twenty twenty three, but you're building a football team for years to come. So you know I think cornerback is still very much in play, but um, defensive tackle. But but what I think the free agency allowed you to do is is really just draft on what. Brad talked about is draft on best player available. I, I, you don't have to reach for a need because you've only got two quarterbacks under contract or or whatever. No, and I think now when you're at the spot that the Lions are, you can kind of get away from even the impacts of a positional value. Like if you think a guard is worth a first round pick at this point and that is your guy. Like, That's the guy on the top of your board. Yeah, you yeah. have the the depth and the the resources to then, you know, pick maybe a, a corner, a more valuable position in the second round because you have two second round picks. So in addition to five picks in the top eighty one, and all of the trades that Brad has made to get this war chest, you also filled in the gaps in free agency with guys that are ready to play now and and. When you're looking to to be a, a playoff team and looking to win the division, you know, rookie corners, Sauce Gardner was great last year. There's been a lot of good rookie corners recently. Historically, not great. Do you want to throw a rookie corner into a major role on a team with playoff expectations? Maybe not, but now you don't have to because right. of free agency. Right. And I think also in play now is your ability to move up. If you identify a guy that you really love, that that you're in that win now mode, it's division or bust, um, and you think he can make an immediate impact and help, you're not concerned about moving up and and losing some of those assets because in free agency you filled those needs like you talked about, or you can move back a little bit if you have a 
uh, uh, some prospects, you know, from whatever. You have tiers. Yeah, you're from gonna your have tier, tier breaks. like from seven to twelve, or are the same tiered player. You have the same grade on them. You can move back and gain something. I just think what they did in free agency with the guys that they re-signed and the guys that they brought in um, from other teams, I think allowed them really a lot of freedom in this draft to just trust their board and 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 pick their guys. And drafting for need is is just something that you can shy away from now because you're looking, you know, years down the line. The, the, the rookie impact, if it's a quarterback that's playing every game or like a, a, a high-value running back, which there obviously is one in this class, like, okay, yeah, they're going to make a real impact as a rookie. But a lot of these times it takes one or two years to really get into a stride. And then you're looking, okay, three years from now you have – Hutchinson and you can take another edge rusher Tyree Wilson who might not be great this year but three years from now those are your your two ends and you're in business if if it pans out that way so you always have to be and I think Brad made it pretty clear yesterday that eyes are downfield like the, you want to win now but the draft is future future based well it was a fun time down here I, I always love coming down to, to to Phoenix and the Biltmore. It's a great spot. You get all the league news. You get Brad. You get Dan. Um, you know, uh, we'll talk to Rod Wood, um, team president, about some of the, the kind of business side of things. The weather was great. We didn't get a lot of bird. No, there's the a, birds a were an bird issue in this Coach little Campbell, spot. But That's all right. I think we got away with it. I think we got away with it, but it was a good time. We'll be back for a pre-draft preview in a couple weeks. And so you could look for that podcast then.